Hello? Mr. Walker? Jim, uh, it's me. I'm going to be a little late this afternoon, I'm afraid. Could we make it about half past two? I'll see you then. Bye. Just to make a simple telephone call like that involves some of the latest technology in communication and a good deal of advanced electronics. Such is the pace in electronics that we tend to take many of its aspects for granted. This telephone exchange, for instance. But it would be a different story if one of these wasn't doing its job properly. Or more precisely, if there was a fault in one of these tiny areas of tin lead solder which connect the components to the printed circuit board. In this film, we're going to be talking about how to help ensure the reliability of soldered joints. In advanced communications and space-age technology, whether it's up there in satellites or down to earth in television sets, calculators and washing machines, electronics rely heavily on the integrity of soldered joints. In the average house, there might be as many as five or 10,000 such joints. In a communication system, that number could run into several billions, sometimes working in pretty tough conditions. And to expect each one to be reliable over a service span as long as 20 years is by no means unusual. But to achieve such a high level of performance in the soldered joints requires a coordinated plan of production right from the design, through assembly, final inspection, and on into service. An ideal production plan would be divided into four distinct stages. Specification, evaluation, control, and assessment. And that's to say, specification at an early stage of the designs, the materials, and the processes evaluation of the components and materials before passing them on for soldering, control of the manufacturing and soldering processes, and assessment of the quality of the finished item. And though we're going to consider each of those four stages in turn, it's as well to remember that correct specification is the common thread running throughout this whole concept of reliability. So, let's consider the first stage, specification. Making a solder joint is essentially a very simple operation, but in the electronics industry, where mass soldering is widely used, it requires more careful thought than in, say, general engineering. I suggest we now consider having a fusing of the tin lead plating as a finish. This is where that whole chain of thought starts. Teamwork and a close cooperation between departments will help ensure that everyone knows what's intended. An exchange of views between, for instance, the design engineer, the production supervisor, and the quality control personnel will be of immense value. Then if problems arise, they can be discussed in the context of the overall project. So, Ed, will you find out the possible extra cost and run? Will you please get samples for... Not to ignore the financial limitations sometimes imposed on a project, the aim is to prepare a closely defined plan which will produce a reliable end result. Money spent at this stage will be a mere fraction of the much greater expense which would be needed later on tracing faults and repairing them in the field. When designing a printed circuit board, Careful attention should be paid to specifications laid down by the customer, by national standards, and in some cases, the company's own standards and rules. From a design point of view, the layout of a board is simply a plan to accommodate the components and to connect them in a logical and space-saving way. But in so doing, the designer must take into account other factors. He must consider the practical aspects of production. For instance, you must specify the grade and the type of laminate. Is it to be paper phenolic? Or should it be epoxy glass? And how is the board itself to be produced? By the subtractive or the additive process? Are the tracks to be laid on one side or on both sides? And if this is the case, he should consider the use of plated through holes. And finally, how is the soldering itself going to be carried out? Manually? or by mass techniques. 
The layout of a board should conform to a standard grid and the width of the tracks and the spacing between them be considered. The general pattern should relate to the direction of the board during the mass soldering operation. In positioning the tracks parallel to the direction of the soldering, we actually minimize the chances of solder bridges occurring across any of these narrow gaps, creating, as they would, short circuits. The diameter of the pads and the size and the spacing of all the through holes is important. And when it comes to components, it is crucial to achieve the correct radial clearance between the component lead and the through hole in which it's positioned. Now, ideally, that should be between 0.1 and 0.25 of a millimeter. Finally, it must be decided whether direct wiring is going to be employed to termination pins or whether the designer is going to use edge connectors. The copper tracks on the boards must be pre-treated to make sure they're in a perfectly soldierable condition. Ideally, they should be protected with a soldierable coating. And this coating, applied to both the copper base and to the leads of the components, must be carefully defined. Coatings of pure tin, or of 60% tin, 40% lead alloy, say between five and 10 micrometers thick, will give the best retention of soldierability under a wide range of storage and service conditions, even in humid atmospheres or those contaminated with sulfur. Coatings can be applied by electroplating or by flow melting, that is, reflowing after plating, or by hot dipping and air leveling. Fusing a plated coating, as in reflowing, for example, will make sure the substrate has wetted well and will have good solderability. However, for short-term storage, lacquer coatings could be adequate. It's not advisable to use gold as a solderable coating, as it can cause serious embrittlement problems when soldered. Although a flash of gold over, say, five micrometers of tin nickel or nickel is acceptable. However, brass terminations require a barrier coating of copper or nickel at least three micrometers thick beneath the tin coating. This will prevent zinc migrating into the tin and impairing the soldierability. But even though the closest specifications have been laid down, it doesn't automatically follow that the components will always meet them. So the second stage in the production plan is evaluation. And evaluation of any parts involved in the making of a PCB is essential. Solderability checks must be carried out on the base laminate, on the printed circuit board, and also on the terminations of any of the individual components. This also applies to any parts bought in from outside contractors. Any evaluation that they have already carried out, particularly if it relates to solderability, should be reaffirmed. So, let's start with the base laminate. Ideally, this should be first checked for solderability before any other work is carried out. Thank you. An internationally approved method of assessing solderability, that is, the wetting properties and tendencies towards de-wetting, is by use of the rotary dip test. The solderability of a copper-clad laminate or an etched PCB is assessed against the known minimum time required to achieve perfect wetting on a prepared substrate. With a 60-40 tin lead solder at 235 degrees C and using a non-activated rosin flux, a wetting time of about two seconds would generally be acceptable. These plain laminate sections are examples of perfect wetting. The molten solder has flowed smoothly and completely covered the base metal. Partial or non-wetting occurs when the solder doesn't flow smoothly or completely cover the surface. 
This can be caused by inadequate pre-cleaning of the base metal or by the presence of a mechanical barrier such as splashed solder resist or by an inadequate time temperature soldering cycle. De-wetting looks something like water lying on a greasy surface and occurs after initial wetting when the solder retracts into discrete globules and ridges. Therefore it's important to specify materials which will not de-wet at normal soldering times. And exactly the same criteria apply once the PCB has been made. Very careful evaluation has to be carried out of the tracks, the pads and the plated through holes. One way of obtaining test samples for this purpose is to include in each production batch a special test board laid out to a known standard. Alternatively, a test coupon can be included as part of a production board. Or perhaps even simpler still, a production board can be taken and from it a special test section cut. This is an example of perfect wetting. Any tendency towards de-wetting shows as a retraction of solder at the edges of the conductor. Solderability of the track is just one aspect of quality control. The thickness of the plating must conform to either national or company standards. And where plated through holes are concerned, excuse me, should continue right through the hole and be of the specified thickness. Solderability in the hole is of vital importance and it should be measured as a matter of routine. Thanks. One further aspect of evaluation which applies to the boards and ought not to be ignored is the effect of prolonged storage. This can be simulated by artificially aging the board before testing it. Of equal importance are the acceptance tests applied to individual components. Thank you. Assuming there are liabilities not in question, once again, the chief factor here is the solderability of the wire terminations. The wetting time should be within an established maximum, and though it won't be, in practice, possible to test every single component, sampling should be carried out on a statistical basis. And as newer and more precise methods of testing are introduced, the parameters to be measured must be decided upon and acceptability limits carefully defined. Now we come to the third stage, the control of the manufacturing processes. And we'll consider this in relation to the actual assembly of the boards with the components. One of the most difficult areas to control is the degradation of the component solderability caused by contamination during handling. Without placing too many restrictions on personnel, good housekeeping should be encouraged in order to reduce contamination. For example, forming or crimping of leads should be carried out under a controlled routine to avoid damage to the surface coating. And a further safeguard is automatic assembly but this has to be considered in the light of an overall production scheme. In some cases, clean room conditions may be required, particularly in the field of microcircuitry. Although the soldering iron is an old friend, it is perhaps an abused one and therefore it's all the more important that its use should also be carefully controlled. The bit size, the shape of the tip, and the correct working temperature shouldn't only be defined, but regularly checked. It's as well to remember that a plain copper bit using a copper containing solder, or a long life iron clad bit, will reduce erosion and increase bit life. When it comes to mechanical soldering, Dipping is perhaps the simplest to control and is often used for special jobs such as securing coil ends to tags. But whichever method is adopted will be largely a matter of what best suits the job in hand. 
which brings me neatly to mass soldering. Controlling the mass soldering operation requires an understanding of the elements involved in making a soldered joint. In themselves, very straightforward. Flux, solder, and enough heat to raise their temperature high enough to do the job. But it is important to choose the correct parameters for all three in order to achieve a reliable joint. A flux with an activated rosin base can vary widely in its activity and may affect the resistance of the final electrical insulation. The choice of flux depends on whether it is to remain on the assembly or be removed after soldering. For certain types of work, it might be as well to consider using water-based fluxes. But in all cases, the density of the flux should be controlled. Selecting the correct solder alloy is equally important so that the joint will have sufficient creep and fatigue strength throughout its service life. A 6040 tin lead alloy is commonly used for automatic soldering in electronics because of its low melting point and good wetting properties. However, other alloys may be more appropriate for specific conditions of service. In the case of wave soldering, where the assembly passes over a standing wave of solder in a matter of seconds, the temperature of the solder, the shape of the wave, and the speed at which the assembly passes over it are very important. There are, of course, other methods of mass soldering. It would be a good idea for the design and production departments to consult to find the most economical, the most effective. Now we have a completed assembly. The components have been correctly placed on the board and securely soldered. And we're almost in a position to move into the last stage of our production plan, assessment of the final assembly. But before that, we must evaluate the effectiveness of any flux removal system. And that's done on equipment like this. So far, there is no satisfactory way of testing a soldered joint without actually destroying it. An electrical test, thank you, will certainly make sure that there are no breaks in the circuitry and that each component is working satisfactorily. But to assess the quality of the soldered joints, we have to rely on a visual examination. And visual examination relies on the experience and judgment of personnel. It should be carried out on all assemblies, but at least it should be carried out on a good proportion of them. The examiners should be checking on the quality of wetting, on the correct characteristics of the solder fillet, low contact angle for instance. They should be checking that the correct amount of solder has been applied to each joint. And all of this is carried out at no more than 10 times magnification. Now in such an assessment, a photographic guide is often a great help. A guide like this one, published by the International Tin Research Institute. In here, there are examples of both good and defective wetting, as well as joints made by mass soldering. Where defects are found, for example icicle formation or the bridging between wire terminals, then they must be reworked. But if the planning to this stage has been good, then the need for extensive, and I stress possibly quite expensive, reworking will be largely removed. So, there they are, the fundamentals of reliable soldering. Specification, evaluation, control, and assessment. Put these four basic ideas into practice, maintain an effective training program, establish a relationship between design and production, and the occasions on which you don't make the right connection will be very rare indeed. <laughs>